Hola, bienvenidos a Diálogos. Eh, esta vez nos encontramos con Paul Cockshot, que es un reconocido eh, teórico, académico, escritor, un prolífico escritor realmente sobre marxismo, comunismo, eh, es un científico de la computación, y yo diría que sus mayores aportes se encuentran en poder formalizar lo que es el, el socialismo hoy. Tenemos a muchísimos teóricos que hablan sobre el socialismo, que hablan sobre el comunismo, pero que no tienen manera de poder explicarlo y no pueden dar mecanismos para saber si el, si el eh, socialismo es posible o no. Lo que trataremos de abordar hoy es, el, por ejemplo, Marx y este, las leyes naturales, eh, la, la common law inglesa, eh, la escuela austríaca de economía, si es posible que el socialismo sea planificado, eh, se puede ir hacia un nuevo socialismo, esos son algunos de los tópicos que vamos a, a tocar hoy, porque con Paul hay demasiadas cosas para hacer. But first of all, and now we're in the English uh, section of this, uh, Paul edited a new uh, book uh, that is, uh, of, of course, towards a new socialism, and it's hacia un nuevo socialismo, if we want to read it in Spanish, and I'm going to share for everyone now uh, that Uh, everyone who wants to read this book uh, can download it, download it from uh, sitcom.org, that is uh, sitcom.org, uh, cybercomunismo, and it is uh, Hace un Nuevo Socialismo, and it was edited, of course, by the guys from uh, cybercomunismo. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to say hello, Paul, how are you? Hi. Okay, so we have a lot of topics to 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 cover, and one of the uh, most prominent things that I notice in your works is that uh, you make uh, like op operative uh, ways of putting socialism. It's not like just after abstract words that we cannot measure, and one of those um, uh, clear examples of that is uh, your works against Mises and their cooperation with Kant Kantorovich and the works against Hayek. Um, among others, but I'm talking about the Austrian School of Economics. So mainly the two topics that I, I want to discuss is the value theory of labor um, and the uh, economic planification. So um, value theory, how can you say that the Marxist theory is true, it's true and the Austrian uh, is false, and economic planification in what the Austrians are wrong. It's not so much that the Austrian theory is false, it's the Austrian theory is vacuous, it makes no concrete predictions, no, no, um, it, it's not a, an operational scientific hypothesis. Um, you, you, there's no way of falsifying it because it makes no concrete predictions, so you can't say, uh, it's not, it's not even false, so it's not not worth discussing. On the other hand, the labor theory of value establishes a relationship between observable quantities in the real world, uh, between the amount of work that's required to make things and the amount of value that flows into an industry using that labor. And you find that, as Marx said and as adam smith said and as ricardo said the two are highly correlated and that is basically what the labor theory of value claimed it claimed it from the 18th century uh it wasn't really until the late 20th century that the data was available to systematically test it And as soon as it was systematically tested, which was done by Sheikh and his co-workers in the in the late 80s or early 90s, it was found to be true. And repeated econometric tests subsequent to that have confirmed it. Neoclassical or the neoclassical theory at least is more concrete than the Austrian, the late Austrian theory. But the problem with the neoclassical theory is it's underdetermined. You, you've got supply and demand curves, which are typically drawn as curves, which implies at least second order polynomials, um, which means it, in order to explain two observables, a price and a quantity, you have uh, four unknowns. So completely undetermined theory. 
if you've got an underdetermined theory, you can't falsify it because it can be, it's got enough free variables or fudge factors so that you can use it to fit any observation you like. Um, I'm going to make a note. Uh, you cite this works in testing marks, that's a paper of yours, and you uh, you quote the the works, the literature of of Shaikh uh, Petrovich and Bolchova, among others. Yes. Uh, uh, but uh, I I I wanted to go to the to the core of the uh, of the Austrian theory that is that uh, the the society reproduces itself through prices, that is, uh, through a spontaneous order. And uh, uh, Friedrich von Hayek actually says that, uh, that the markets are guided by prices and, uh, and a society cannot function without prices. So do you find this uh, hypothesis well, that is the, 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 the statement that the order in a commodity producing society is spontaneous or anarchic isn't due to Hayek. I mean, that's that's common parlance of the whole socialist uh, literature in the late 19th century, early 20th century. So there's nothing specifically Hayekian about that claim. The, the um, claim that is uh, absurd on Hayek's part is that uh, an economy can't function without crises because we know for prolonged periods, um, economic, well, fairly prolonged periods, economies have operated without crisis. We know the, the Soviet economy didn't undergo any recessions um, from the time they started planning to, to the time it was um, broken up. So it's, it's I meant, I meant prices. I meant prices, not crisis. Prices. Oh, cr prices, not crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, sorry. Um, depends what he means by prices, doesn't it? Uh, yes. Well, uh, this this is uh, this actually can be found in Hayek and Friedman that uh, you don't need to know what happens in the coal market or in the oil market. You just need to know the final prices. Society reproduces itself by the guidance of prices. So in a free market. Yeah, but there's Hayek, nothing actually. there's nothing Hayekian about that. Marx said that in Poverty of Philosophy. I mean that's mm -hmm, just a, a description of commodity producing society. Well, that's true of commodity producing society, yes, but it doesn't prove that that's true of all societies. It's just empirically it's not true of all societies. Going uh, further in the in the Aus in the Austrian uh, thought, uh, there is this thing about the the impossibility of calculation. Uh, that of course this is uh, well known since uh, von Mises wrote socialism that it cannot be possible to uh, to calculate every single market, uh, every single uh, area in an economy, and you prove that that is false. So why that uh, assumption that is uh, repeated today, why that is false? I mean, it, it is repeated because it's um, there's a political motivation between b behind repeating it. The feasibility of calculating without a market had been established um, by Soviet mathematicians and by Langer in the 50s and 60s uh, so the and the, the, they were even obliged to give uh, Kantorovich uh, the Nobel Prize for showing that this was doable so uh, Hayek could hardly say he was unaware of it because he attended the Nobel meeting where Kantorovich was there even if Hayek was, was there I mean if it, that that is like common sense to Today well, and uh, he, Hayek never attempted to refute Kantorovich. Well, no, but you, you had some uh, Austrian theory uh, scholars that say that uh, the USSR uh, collapsed due to the impossible of uh, economic calculation. Well, the alternative account would be that it that uh, the Soviet Union couldn't afford 
to the cost of the arms race which uh, Ronald Reagan put on it. Uh, a smaller country couldn't afford the level of armaments expenditure necessary to engage in military competition with the larger economy of the United States, which was backed up by German, Japanese and European industrial production. I mean, you, you, you look at the, the rate of improvement of labor productivity in the United States and Britain compared to Germany and Japan during the period from 1950 to the fall of the Soviet Union. You can see that in Germany and Japan, the rate of improvement in labor productivity was much greater, much greater than it was in, in the UK and the USA. The difference was that the UK and the USA had much bigger armaments built as victors in the the, the the Second World War and countries that maintained large armed forces and nuclear weapons, a large part of their um, engineering expertise went into producing armaments. This did not occur in Japan and Germany. So that the engineering expertise there went into improving products and improving productivity. The Soviet Union was in an even more extreme case than Britain or the United States. In the Soviet Union, not only had to fend a, a larger share of its national income on weapons, but it also faced trade embargoes, which limited its access to, for instance, high density computer chips. Now, if you were to take the comparative performance of British industry, to the comparative performance of Soviet industry. It's clear that Soviet industry actually improved productivity and improved overall output significantly better than Britain did. It started much behind, but it did better. But if you had cut Britain off from the ability to import semiconductor chips from the USA and Japan, British performance would have been even worse. Now, you can't, you can't isolate the, the final failure of the USSR from the military competition and um, trade embargoes the country faced. Well, uh, uh, finishing with this uh, thing with the Austin School, uh, one of the uh, um, strongest arguments that uh, Hayek uh, uh, does, and actually it's not taking into account in the literature or maybe uh, to uh, uh, the general uh, public that discusses his works is uh, that he always correlates the common law system that, for example, in the UK or, or United States, the common law system with uh, a better performance in economy. Why did... But, why did Britain fall so far behind Germany and Japan then? Exactly, yes, uh, that's the point that I wanted to make. Uh, but the thing is that uh, uh, what will be the thing, because you talk about this in, in, in your books, uh, the legal system in a communist society. If you want to get a, a grasp of this, you should read the work of uh, Pashukhanis, General Theory of Law and Marxism. Dates from the late 1920s. Um, and it is an extended treatise on the extent to which mm -hmm. the basic categories of capitalist law are categories which arise from commodity exchange. And this applies not just to civil law, but uh, the the ideas in criminal law as well um that it, 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 the society is so deeply entrenched in commodity production that its entire mode of thinking about law is is influenced by that there's a very interesting paper of you that uh that is called uh, a note on the organic composition of capital and profit rates and one thing that uh comes to my mind is that uh how uh, you come into the, the conclusion that um, well, actually, uh, 
there is a substantial and, and I'm going to uh, say I'm going to read it. There is a substantial and statistic, statistic, statistically significant negative association between organic composition and profit rate across sectors. Yes. And the empirical evidence is from the U.S. economy from 1987. So uh, is it, this... It's subsequently been verified for all the other OECD countries. It's a necessary consequence of the law of value. Yes, and well, that was the point that I, that I wanted to, to explore. How is that the necessary co consequence of the law of value? Because value is created by labor if the ratio of new labor to the value of capital stock falls the ratio of profit to capital stock will tend to fall as well and therefore that will appear as a lower rate of profit ricardo had a false hypothesis that the rate of profit would equalize but it, it isn't true. It's an illusion, an illusion engendered by competition. The idea that um, the profit rate equalizes is a side effect of the stock market, because if you look at the stock market, the rate of return on different types of shares will tend to equalize. But that's because the prices of the shares move up and down to ensure the equalization. And that can happen very rapidly. Um, but actual physical capital can't move in the same way as the price of shares in the stock market. And you can't transfer capital in the form of railway bridges into capital in the form of semiconductor plants. They're, they're, they're physically different things and they're not mobile. And and, and, and yes, and, and I, I, I was thinking uh, related with the with the with the re re relation of labor and and profit. Uh, there is a, a sentence that I know better in, in Spanish than in English, but it, it says like uh, Marx stated that uh, the middle class will, will get uh, that the, sorry that the pro proletarian will get uh, poorer uh, within the years. And well, the argument is that, well, we cannot see that today because uh, people are living better. But in a paper of yours, you demonstrate that uh, uh, that since the 1970s, there is uh, a deeply uh, concentration of profit and the relation between capital and labor is even, uh, uh, it's bigger uh, since the 1970s. How uh, can you explain that? Well, the, 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 the subdivision of income between social classes depends on a number of factors. Um, among them, the relative rate of growth of the, the working class, if it's growing rapidly relative to the stock of capital, then the share of wages tends to fall. If the stock of capital is rising rapidly relative to the size of the working class, then the bargaining position of the working class is strong and wages tend to rise. Other factors are the legal environment, whether trade unions are in a strong legal position or whether the legislation represses the organization of trade unions. So all these things change with time. Um, during the period from 19... Say 1939 to um, the mid to late 1970s, the conditions were favorable to trade unions, and in the developed capitalist countries, I, that probably was not the case um, in South America, but in developed capitalist countries, that was true. And as a result, the relative share of national income going in profit fell and the relative share in national income going on wages rose. What happened after that was firstly, legal measures were taken against trade unions to restrict their power. Secondly, the rate of accumulation of capital slowed down, and this created chronic unemployment, 
periods of chronic unemployment mean that the bargaining position of labor becomes poor and wages stagnate or improve very slowly. Uh, for, for the United States, it's very dramatic. From the mid-1970s, the rising level of real wages stops and the condition of a large part of the population either stagnates or gets worse. And this is most dramatically shown by the falling life expectancy in the United States now. Yes, which but, Angus uh, Deaton got his, his prize for. Yes, but if, even though it may sound like uh, trivial, uh, I would like to know uh, what proper what pr properties would define neoliberalism for you? Because you mentioned that word, that notion uh, in your in your text, and it's a con it's a concept you, you use and for example when referring to this case that uh the mixed economy of the united of the united kingdom that uh, uh that got split after the 1970s and you call this the neoliberal period so what will be neoliberalism because there is no consensus uh for this uh it, i mean it's a loose concept. it's a loose term but it, it designates a period when um, there was a return to in economic ideology to the ideas of classical liberalism you got this with the growing influence for, of monetarist theorists like friedman the growing influence of hayek for a period uh, and the eclipsing of what was taken to be common sense in the previous previous period which was that the state had to plan things uh there was a the, the things i'm describing there are the influence of economic ideas but they actually result in a change in economic policy um it's it's arguable that if you look at um the EU, there were always differences between the model of France and Germany and that the transition to a neoliberal model in um, the EU probably didn't come until you had the Maastricht and, Lis and Lisbon treaties, at which point a a German auto liberal ideology becomes entrenched in international treaty and it then becomes very difficult for individual states to change their economic policies. I mean, the last serious attempt by the French to get out of that was un under Mitterrand. And since then, it's been almost impossible for any European state to follow a policy that is significantly divergent from um, that set by the ordo or neoliberal strictures of the Lisbon Treaty. And the yes, instance so... that, that the governments are replaced by technocrats when they attempt to do that, as, it, as has happened in Italy. So yes, but uh, um, I think that you're referring to a to a pattern here, and I. But if we see that in Germany we have ordo liberalism and we have like a more pure liberalism in in the UK or in or in the United States, and but it's different in France. What is the pattern? What are the common properties that we can see uh, for defining uh, neoliberalism? Well, it, it it's a term used to apply to two things. One is an ideology, and two is a set of economic policies. Now. Um, the dominance or the strengthening of the ideology occurred before the, the shift 
in economic policy in some countries. Um, the, but the, sh the shift to, in economic policy from country to country took longer. Uh, in, in some countries, it took a considerable period of time. It's pretty clear that the neoliberal period is, uh, is coming to an end in Britain. Um, the, the policies of the current government since leaving the European Union are a shift much more towards the kinds of policies that were followed in the 50s and 60s. And part, well, part, in... partly this is to, due to the fact that the non-liberal policies actually require the nation state and the independence of the nation state. Mm -hmm. But in the same sense, uh, you uh, there's like a misconception generally in the concept of uh, socialism because um, I and, and I find some uh, different definitions in your own work because if uh, socialism is the workers being the owners of the means of production. Uh, how is that related when you talk about the socialist um, um, policies that the that the British state took um, where it was a mixed economy? What will be the socialist measures that took uh, this? Because well, it, yeah, you got to realize there was a big sort of discussion on what socialism meant in the uh, Labour Party, a social democratic movement in, in Britain. Uh, one position was that socialism was whatever the Labour government did, which was Crossland's position. And whatever the Labour government did was largely a compromise between the pressures of the working class and the, the real situation of the then existing British economy. But the Certainly, until the end of the Harold, second Harold Wilson government, the commitment of the Labour Party, at least in principle and to a large degree in practice, was to establish common ownership of the means of production. Their party uh, um, rules bound them to that. That was the objective of the party, was to establish common ownership of the means of production. And if you look at what they actually did, step by step, they were doing that. Now, it was far less speedy or radical than communist parties that came to power in, in the 1940s would have done. But it the, the, the basic direction of travel was quite clear. Um, it, it was to progressively take over more and more of the economy, either directly in the form of uh, state enterprises or from the 1970s or some pre idea that they would take over some of them as worker-owned enterprises. But uh, this was a political objective. It was a political objective that had been established in the working class political party after the First World War and remained so until really the 1980s. And now comes to my mind that uh, uh, that in, in Britain were a, a huge discussion uh, about the public schools. I, I, I think that, that this was uh, something big in the, in, the, in the 60s and it ended up by a failing no, no, that's not what happened. Uh, no? Firstly, okay. you've got to re realize that in England, the term public schools actually means private schools. Uh, mm -hmm. the, there was no significant increase in private schools uh, over that period. The big issue was whether or not the state schools should be divided into two types of state school one type of state school which was designed to train people for the middle class jobs and another type of state school which was designed to train people for working class jobs which had been the situation 
up until the mid-1960s. Um, the movement from the 1960s was to establish a single, what's called comprehensive schooling system, which all pupils would go through. And that was established successfully almost across the whole country uh, with very few regions or cities not having that. Under the Tony Blair's government in the early 2000s, there was an influence of neoliberal ideology to the uh, extent that uh, some private or semi-private organizations were given the right to run schools. But they were not private schools in the sense of private commercial enterprises. They were essentially subcontracted state-funded schools. It was, um, it was a means by which people set up in some cases charitable organizations in some cases organizations which were effectively to the benefit of their head teachers which would um, run schools in return for funds from the local authority instead of the local authority running them but they only make up a small proportion of all the schools that it was an idea promoted by Tony Blair. The reasons why this was done are tied in with European monetary policy, which set limits on state borrowing. As a result, in order to get a lot of new schools built, the Labour government, which came to power in, in 1996, couldn't follow the old policy which the Labour Party had followed in the past, which was of just getting the individual towns to borrow money and build the schools. The European treaties set limits on the amount of borrowing. Therefore, if they wanted new schools built, they had to cook the books in some way. And the way they did it was to get private companies to build the buildings which were then paid for by the city. And this was just a technique to get the borrowing off the official state books so that they could pass the, the rules of the European Union. In, in effect, it was very expensive because whilst the government can borrow cheap, if a, a private company builds a school and leases it to the the city, the private company will charge much more profit than the city would have had to pay as a public body borrowing on the money market. So it was an expensive policy imposed in consequence of the uh, European Union monetary policy. But all of that was part and parcel of the victory of neoliberal ideology against social democratic ideology within the country. Um, the, the great thing for the um, finance capital in Britain is that by getting these rules written into international treaty, they could then say to the government, well, you've got no option but to, to do it this way, which is, of course, immensely profitable for the, the financial institutions. Yes, but I was talking about the Ed Education Act of 1944. That will be a socialist political decision. Yeah. Well, what yeah. about it? That, that, that established um, free secondary education across the country. Exactly, yes. Yeah, the, the issue was uh, that became politically active in the 1960s was to reform that to make it into instead of a two-tier system a single tier system and to raise the school leaving age from 14 to 16. 
Yes, but the background was wasn't at all in a revolutionary government. It was a reformist one. Yes, yeah. But the, the reason why the reformist government was able to carry out very radical measures in uh, 1945 was, on the one hand, there were Red Guard tank regiment. Uh, you know, the, the 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 first Guard tank army was on the the Odenizer line, and two, the um, government had been elected on soldiers' votes. There was no possibility that the upper classes could carry out any kind of coup against the Attlee government because it had been voted in by the troops. Any attempt to, to, to carry out a coup against it would have uh, resulted in the troops' mutiny. But without being a revolutionary government, uh, what socialist elements could the Wolferstedt have re realized? Well, the if you go and look at the either the demands of the Communist Manifesto or the demands of the Workers' Party of France, which was also drafted by Marx in the 19th century, you can see a number of the key um, objectives that had originally been communist objectives had percolated into the general socialist movement and became uh, actual programmatic objectives. So one of them obviously was the, this was in the Communist Manifesto, that the means of transport and communication should be in the hands of the state. That was one of the first things that the um, the Attlee government did. They nationalized the railways, road transport, and the canals, and telecommunications were already state property. The, so that's one of the key things. Second thing, uh, if you recall, the Communist Manifesto calls for a steep progressive income tax. And the same thing was called for in the program of the French Workers' Party. The Stafford Cripps, who was the Chancellor of the Exchequer under Attlee, raised the rate of income tax on the wealthy to 97.5%. So effectively a confiscatory level of income tax on high incomes. The, uh, the other demand of the Communist Manifesto was the abolition of the right of inheritance. Well, they in they introduced extremely steep inheritance taxes. Later on, the upper classes were able to find ways around this. They, they found various means by which they could transfer the property from uh, ownership in Britain to ownership in British crown colonies in the Channel Islands or Barbados and what have you and evade the taxes. But initially, they didn't know how to do that. Um, so the, the, those measures were introduced. Next measure from the Communist Manifesto they carried out was the establishment of a state bank. They nationalized the, the, the Bank of England, brought that into public country. The other demand from the Communist Manifesto they carried through was the extension of factories and works owned by the state. So. A series of industries, gas, electricity, um, coal, oil, steel, shipbuilding, aircraft construction, large part of car construction, all of these were taken into public ownership. Um, I, I should also have mentioned, I suppose, a substantial amount of coastal shipping was also taken into public ownership. So the the measures that they were putting through were those ones were all already in the communist manifesto there are other measures which were written by marx in the french workers party program um, among them was that uh, health care should be free and paid for by the state 
that was something Marx had advocated in the 1880s, and that that was put into practice in 1948. Um, the the, the principle of the upkeep of the cost of upkeep of children should be education should be free and the cost of upkeep of children should be met by the state this that wasn't done entirely but there were substantial um steps towards that in that there were special food supplements for for children provided free there was milk provided free in the schools the meals were provided free in the schools um, so that elements of these were, were introduced. So there's a, the point is that the measures that Marx had advocated in the 19th century were measures he believed workers' parties would be able to bring about if they won elections. He thought these were practical measures they could bring about. And these ideas percolated into the general socialist movement, such that when uh, the Labour Party did take power, these were part of the common sense or the common heritage of what everyone believed in. Yes, but uh, this uh, took, took place uh, through uh, the common democratic uh, voting uh, process and i have to say that it was uh, according to the to the times you know in in those times very parts of the world you have um, the the same measures or similar measures but even if economic calculation is possible a new socialism must confront with nowadays political reality is that feasible because i mean we live in a world with flexible markets, with markets ruled by collaborative applications or collaborative e e economies such as Uber, Airbnb, and so on. So what work can be done? But the, all of those are, the, the operation of those is due to specific um, legal frameworks that allow Uber to evade the, the regulations which would otherwise um, any taxi company would be liable to. So th this this is part of a, an explicit liberal transformation of production relations and legal regulations, which can be changed. You can change change the law back to the to one where. In, Uber would be treated just as an employer and would have to pay wages, you'd have to pay uh, insurance, have to give holidays, etc. Yes, but how is it possible to change people's thought? Because uh, I know that you're referring to this uh, entry barriers and so on and regulations in the Uber market, but uh, but people are used to, to Uber or people are used to Airbnb and all that. So, and that, and that is worldwide, uh, worldwide. Yeah. So, uh, yes, but there is also, change that? There is also considerable opposition to it. And these things will be determined by struggle in the end. Um, the, there are legal cases going through to try and establish that Uber has the same obligations to its drivers as any other company would have. And the, the rights which workers had in the um, post-war period were ones which were accreted gradually by a series of legal victories running back to the late 19th century. And with organization and pressure, these similar legal victories can be won. Yes, but I'm not I'm not talking about uh, Uber or the world of work. I'm just talking that uh, today we live in a, a liberal ideology that uh, I'm, I'm actually writing while, while I'm, I'm speaking due to um, uh, issues with with internet but uh we live in a liberal I ideology so uh in to go 
to a new socialism we have to change like every mind in every country it's not only like in russia and the ussr or in china um no we it it will be like a change in the liberal world or in the west yes but i mean that's that had to occur in order to establish a socialist movement in the first place the circumstances which the neoliberals have created economically has been one in which class contradictions have become uh, aggravated so that for example for the first time in the united states there is for the, sorry for the first time since the early 20th century opinion polls show substantial support among the younger generation for ideas of socialism in the US, whereas that simply wasn't the case beforehand. The degradation of the conditions of what they call in America the middle class produces these results. The, the, the whole political establishment of liberalism is being undermined. The whole ideological legitimacy of the state is being undermined. It's questionable whether the United States territorial integrity can even be maintained. You, you, they, ha they have tested their social relations to destruction with uh, neoliberalism and whether or not open class warfare breaks out in the United States is a, a very um, open question. No one would have said that 30 years ago, but a large proportion of the people in the United States think that there's going to be another civil war. That's not a condition of social stability. That's a condition of a society entering into terminal crisis. Yes, but but actually, with the case of the United States, uh, is that uh, the, this thing of American uniqueness uh, that there there is no uh, big socialist party in the in the United States. So, um, how would you create this class conscious of that socialism is needed in the United States, or or actually in Argentina and in 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 France, and you know, in such uh, well, different in in my view it has to come through a, a movement for radical democracy in the united states there's no such movement yet but the gilets jaunes in in france were spontaneously raising these demands so you see that in the in the short term there, there are like uh like some exits to socialism some path to socialism the, the, even if the, they are small in in the current situation the first priority has to be to break down the existing form of class rule by introducing radical democracy and this was the objective of the gilet jean and it was quite correct objective in the united states it's not clear because of the the way the ruling classes in America are able to polarize um, the population behind two different fractions of the ruling class between um, the Democrat fraction, which is uh, essentially a liberal high tech fraction and the Republican fraction. Now, the contradictions there are extremely acute. But unless a socialist movement arises with a program which can unite those two, what you're going to get is just a descent into civil war and the end of American hegemony because of the breakup of the United States. If that happens, the worldwide dominance of liberal ideology is put into a, a bit of a crisis because it has taken the United States as its exemplar and as its constitutional model. 
and you get a period of chaos in which all sorts of different things will contend. And do you consider, because uh, uh, first of all, to, to make the question, if Cuba is actually uh, or was a, so a socialist uh, state, because on the 11th of July of le last year, uh, there was uh, tremendous uh, mobilizations all over the, the island. So uh, there seems to be a, a, a big opposition in socialist uh, uh, countries as well. How big that opposition was, I don't know. I mean, it, it received a considerable amount of publicity. Whether it really was influential and enough to threaten the, the existing order in Cuba is another matter. And how in, in you, if you compare it to the level of um, disorder that was going on in the United States, it was nothing. Mm -hmm. and, and how would you evaluate the performance of, of, of Cuba con, 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 considering that it, it went through the special period in the 90s and uh, it got recovered in the early uh, years of this century, but now it's, it's having this backlash. Again, how would you evaluate uh, uh, Cuba? I, I, I'm not in a position to give any expert opinion on the state of the Cuban economy. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't examined Cuban economic statistics at all, so I can't comment. Because it will be, it, it will have again a uh, harmony uh, between labor and capital, and it will not uh, lead to this uh, chaos and civil war that you were mentioning before, for example, in the United States. Well, The, I, I'm not sure what, how you think um, you're going to get from the United States to a set of worker states. It's, my, it's quite possible that that may happen. But were that to happen, it would radically change the, the, the political atmosphere across the whole world. At the moment, the, the socialists in the United States whilst they're growing in influence, are to a substantial extent subordinated or incorporated with the, um, the Democratic Party or identifying with the Democratic Party. That cuts them off from a large portion of the population. So um, unless a different uh, political line is adopted, I don't see that they're likely to come to power very soon. What is more likely is that the dominance of um, the United States as the dominant world power is coming to an end pretty soon. Um, the decisive factor is likely to be the political, internal political struggles within China. Yes, uh, yes. Well, that was uh, actually discussed in this pro program, the, the new role of um, the geopolitical war that China has. And you uh, developed a history of work and it's actually curious because, uh, well, actually in Argentina and Spain, there is a huge uh, hypothesis that claims that uh, the Roman Empire Uh, fell due to uh, price control. So there is no uh, labor relation at all there. So uh, what, what would be your answer to that uh, hypothesis? That, that is quite popular in Argentina, actually. I've never come across that um, in, in the ancient history. The, the, you know, the historians of the ancient, economic historians of the ancient world People mention Diocletian's price edict, but this is a, something which had a brief operation. It wasn't a, a long-term um, factor. You have to explain changes which occurred over centuries and, and 
Diocletian's price edict is is a short term factor. You don't start understanding changes in social relations across a whole um, continent or in a half continent and well parts of three continents on the basis of uh, a short term prices policy by one emperor. And well, and uh, actually, well, uh, one of the uh, key uh, topics that, that that is actually going in the same uh, time in Spain and Argentina is that the USSR uh, fell again the price control and uh, the the state control of the economy and of course uh, reading your words you prove that 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 is false so uh, how would you answer to this uh, uh, common the the, the, the... The Soviet Union, in the last few years of its existence, suffered from suppressed inflation and then open inflation. And the reason it did that was a series of shocks to the um, tax system and what was basically a a poor tax system from the start. There was inadequate mechanism for an income tax. The It relied too much on value added taxes. These are, these lead to distortions in the real costs of the economy. And then under the Gorbachev government, there were a series of measures which made this substantially worse. The ban on the sale of alcohol, which was introduced in order to improve health and improve labor discipline, also removed a major source of tax revenue, since the tax on alcohol was a significant source of um, tax revenues. Since they didn't have alternative taxes which they could put up, this led to uh, an uncontrolled growth of the money supply and suppressed inflation. It became even worse when authorization was given to enterprises to retain the profits they made. And this, this was done at the advice of liberal economists, and it made the financial situation of the state w still worse because the revenues they'd previously obtained from state factories were greatly reduced, whereas the obligations of state expenditure were not reduced. So you had a, 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 a financial crisis of the state. The Roman Empire also had a financial crisis of the state over the latter period. Partly this becomes evident in the successive devaluations of the denarius during the third century, uh, during which the silver content of the denarius was gradually reduced. Why did this happen? It's because the Roman Empire ran a trade deficit with neighboring areas with the barbarian kingdoms and to an extent in trade with the Far East. This depleted the, the monetary base and resulted in an increasingly token currency. Now a token currency is viable if you, the state has an efficient taxation system. But the taxation system, once areas became not um, purely uh, subjugated territories, but were given free city status, was poor. The, the, uh, there was not a, anything like an income tax or a land tax operating on the property classes. So that the state revenue tended to decline. The decline in state revenue meant that it was difficult to maintain a salaried bureaucracy. Instead of having a salaried bureaucracy, the bureaucrats had to be given uh, territorial 
grants of land from which they could collect the rents. And this gradually leads to the transition from a centralized state to a semi-feudal, less centralized and less efficient state structure. But this is not due to price controls. It's, it's due to a failure of the state revenue system and a general collapse of um, the monetary sector of the economy, which had a, a deeper productive basis, which was the shrinking share of uh, slave production, which is, is, tends to be pro-market production, and an increasing shift of the mode of exploitation into one where the upper classes, instead of running slave estates, would have colony, which was if essentially becoming serfs. So you're getting a transformation of the relations of production, which were less favorable to commodity production, and in the process, less favorable to a monetary economy, which should sustain the kind of bureaucracy that a large empire needed. Price controls are nothing to do with it, or a, a temporary measure to try and overcome the um, inflation of the denarius. The for after um, Diocletian, you had the re-establishment of a gold standard currency. You actually got substantial in the eastern area of the Roman Empire, at least. You got a substantial um, re-emergence of uh, of trade and commodity production, and those areas of the empire didn't collapse. Well, when, when you were talking about the USSR, uh, that remind me of a lecture that Major Friedman gave that he uh, said that uh, inflation wasn't uh, an illness of, it wasn't an American illness, it wasn't a Soviet illness, it was a printing uh, press uh, illness. So uh, I want to know how do you evaluate the quantitative theory of money that uh, Milton Friedman made famous in the 1970s and 1980s. That is common knowledge. To, well, um, it, it, it's, it's, been dis it's been discredited more recently because um, the um, thing is you, you, you've you had increases in the money supply for 15, 20 years without market inflation, um, or at least not the degree of inflation that Friedman would have proposed. So it's clear that his, his theory is too simple. There's not to say that you can the state can go on funding itself through um, money creation indefinitely. Certainly, if, it's, if it allows its tax revenue system to deteriorate, then the effectiveness of it being able to um, command um, value, the state money effectiveness to command value will, will depreciate and it won't be possible to do that. Yes, and if you can, as, as we always do with every guest, if you can uh, recommend a book that uh, you would like to the audience to read that uh, could be fiction or non-fiction, so whatever you you want. Well, I, I mean, obviously I recommended one of my own books at the beginning, but that's cheating. Um, I would recommend people read Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed. Yes, and I think that an, an, another guest uh, actually recommended that if I am not wrong. But thank you, Paul, for your time. And of course, this is going to be uh, seen in February or March. It depends on my uh, ability to uh, edit uh, this. But uh, thank you for the time. And I hope you have a great evening. Okay. Bye for now.